fund directly marketing for Geo, the foundation for informal possibility. Today, I'm here to share with you our vision for the future of blockchain music. So instead of just going through a presentation and just talking your ears off before lunch, I'm going to do a bit of a thought experiment. Uh, this is a blockchain conference, so I want to ask how many of you actually own the crypto? All right, well, first of all, uh, don't ever answer that question. Uh, <laughs> if someone ever asks you if you own crypto, just say no. Uh, I'm not very good for personal security. But for those of you who do own crypto, I want to ask you to think through a very common scenario. Let's say after this conference, you guys decide to go out to a bar uh, and get some drinks together. Uh, and it's with a bunch of people that you don't necessarily know, so people that you just met today. And at the end of the night, you have to deal with a very common problem that everybody usually deals with, which is, how do you split the bill? Now, since we're all blockchain fanatics, you want to get paid in crypto. So how exactly do you go about doing that process? I want you to think through what the actual process would be of collecting crypto from a group of people right after a restaurant meal or a bar tab. Well, there's a couple problems that you'll run into immediately. First of all, not everybody necessarily has a mobile wallet. They don't necessarily even have a way to get you any cryptocurrency. Now, assumedly, one of you is just going to pay with your credit card and have everyone pay you back since, let's be honest, no restaurant or bar actually wants to accept crypto right now. And so you're going to have to figure that out. You have multiple people who all own different cryptocurrencies on different wallets, on different devices, in different places, that all need to somehow get you crypto. So how exactly from that point on do you actually make that transaction happen? Well, there's a couple of things that would have to happen. You would have to, one, get the name and probably email or cell phone number of every single individual that was at that table. You need to ask each one of them which cryptos that they have. You would have to tell them which crypto you actually want. And you would actually need to ask them for their public address or give them your public address. So think through that process of getting your public address from your wallet to a group of people. And then think about how many things can go wrong with that process. You would have to send it to them somehow. So you would have to text it or you would have to email it. Hopefully, they will copy and paste that public address from their email or from their cell phone to their wallet successfully and they click the send button, and then hopefully they put in the right amount of crypto and the right type of crypto to actually send to you. Now, assuming everything goes right in this process, you will receive some crypto in your wallet. The problem being, you won't actually know who sent you that crypto. All you'll see is from this public address to your public address. It means nothing, there's no context. You're not actually sure which person actually sent you that crypto. The only way for you to verify is to actually call them or email them and say, hey, is this your transaction? Was, was this you who actually sent me this amount? So this is problematic. Um, and the foundation for interwallet operability exists for one reason and one reason alone. We believe if blockchain is to achieve its potential for enabling easy decentralized movement of value, the user experience of moving that value in a decentralized manner must improve dramatically. So who are we? The foundation for interwallet operability is a blockchain project, but it's a consortium of wallets, exchanges, and crypto payment processors. We as a collective group have come together in support of a usability protocol called the Beal Protocol. And the goal of the Beal Protocol is simple, mass usability. We want to make crypto as easy to use for everyone on the planet. And we don't want to do it in such a way that we actually defy the fundamental reasons that we got into blockchain in the first place. It needs to be censorship resistant, resistant. it needs to be immutable, it needs to be decentralized. So right here is a list of a bunch of wallets and exchanges that are already field members. Field members just being different crypto companies that have agreed uh, to integrate the field protocol eventually. Uh, I put plus two more because we have actually two others that we haven't announced yet, uh, which will be coming out shortly. Uh, hopefully some of you at least recognize a few of these logos on this screen. Uh, it contains the majority of the mobile wallets uh, that are in the ecosystem, a couple of desktop wallets, uh, and in the future a couple of exchanges as well. So what exactly is the problem? So I actually have a question to ask you. How many of you who own crypto have actually sent crypto to somebody else within the last six months? Okay, some of you, not all of you. That's actually more than kind of what we've seen in the past. 
We actually conducted a survey earlier this year asking that specific question. How many people actually have sent their crypto to somebody else? And what was their experience? And they actually did so. And this is what we found. 75% of people who actually sent crypto to somebody last year felt less than confident when sending crypto. And what I mean by that wasn't, it isn't that they don't know the process of how to send crypto, like they don't understand how to actually use the send section of their wallet. What I mean was, when they actually click the send button, when they're doing a transaction, how confident are they that they actually did everything correctly? How confident are they that they didn't mess something up in their public address? That they didn't mess something up with the token? That they didn't mess something up with the transaction fee? That they didn't mess something up with the amount? 55% have had a problem with the transaction. Some of them minor, some of them major, some of them catastrophic. But 55% experienced some sort of problem with sending a transaction. And then finally, and probably most alarmingly, is probably this statistic right here. 80%. Over the last year, people who have actually sent crypto actually lost funds or experienced a failed transaction due to a mistake that they made with a public address. Now, not every blockchain treats a public address the same. With Bitcoin, it's actually very hard to just randomly put in the wrong Bitcoin address. But the theory of it is, you can just flip a digit accidentally, and your crypto goes nowhere. Um, but the reality is that a lot of people struggle. Uh, they struggle with public addresses. They struggle with the concept of crypto, uh, cryptography, public and private keys. People just don't get it. Those of us in this room who are fanatics about blockchain, maybe we get it. But even those of us in this room, maybe we don't really understand what's actually happening underneath all, all of it. So, what is the solution? Is it just to get rid of public addresses? This is a seal that we use in a lot of our own marketing materials. Banish public addresses is what we said. That is part of what we're trying to accomplish, and it's probably the thing that people relate to the most. However, this is a necessary but not sufficient solution to the problem of blockchain usability. I'll actually let you in a secret. We're actually not really the first people to even try to do this particular thing. Uh, I think actually when I first started at this company, we did an evaluation of a number of competitors that all tried to do some sort of what's probably called a wallet name solution. And I think at this point there's maybe, uh, I don't know, 25 companies that have tried something similar to this. And so what exactly is the problem? Why aren't people embracing these sort of solutions if it makes it so much easier? If everyone knows that the public address is difficult, then you can replace it with an easy, human readable name. Why aren't people doing it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. I won't get into all of them, but I think there's one very obvious one which is, I'm guessing the vast majority of you don't even realize that there are other solutions like this that already exist in the market. And there's a reason why. It's because most of the solutions that actually exist that allow you to wallet naming are actually equally, if not more difficult to use than public addresses themselves. They require you to get a specific application, they make you go to specific websites, they have complicated registration processes to actually purchase one of these things. You sometimes have to go through multiple, multiple steps. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Sometimes you can lose them for no particular reason. There's been a couple of all of these solutions that have actually suffered, I won't say which one, that actually suffered, not necessarily a hack of their own system, but accidentally released important branded domain names. Um, to just a random hacker, things that are very, very valuable to the market. And so things just go wrong with things. Um, and so the reality is that none of these have really gained traction. So how is Theo going to go about doing this differently? Well, the way that Theo is actually constructed is that instead of being a wallet that you have to download, or being a standalone blockchain that's meant to absorb all other blockchains, our goal is very simple. We're not making our own wallet, we make wallets more usable. We're not making a competing blockchain against Ethereum or against Bitcoin or anything like that. We are creating a blockchain that services all of those blockchains. We allow those blockchains to become more usable by allowing them to take advantage of the usability features that we enable so that they can focus on what makes their blockchain actually unique. For Bitcoin, it's decentralization. For others, it might be smart contracts. For others, it might be high transactions per second, whatever they want. So, how do we go about doing this? Well, there's a couple of important ethoses within blockchain that we try to maintain. Obviously, being open source and decentralized is a big part of what we're trying to do. Um, economic incentives is actually a big part of what we do as well. 
Uh, one of the big failures of a lot of native solutions is that they require integrators. Now, if you're trying to keep everything within the wallet garden, within one ecosystem, then sure, you can just try to capture everyone to one wallet application, but the reality is, is that it's unlikely, at least in the short term, that one wallet is just going to take over the entire industry. So there's always going to be a choice there, and there's a choice that people have to make. The other problem is that ultimately, these wallets are the ones that actually have to put in the development work to actually integrate these solutions. And there's no incentive for them to do that besides a bunch of users yelling at them and Telegram. They're not really incentivized to do that. Um, and so one core principle about how Fear was actually constructed is that on a protocol level, there's actually an economic thing. And the people who are actually closest to the users and actually understand the problems their users are facing with on a daily basis because they get the customer support tickets of, where did all my crypto go? I went to send Bitcoin. Why isn't it working anymore? Is this your fault? Not the Celia wallet? <laughs> the non Celia wallet community managers have to go, no, 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 this is just the way cryptocurrencies work. You have to you know, refresh. You need to check up on the block explorer. You need to see whether or not things are actually happening. It's not necessarily our problem. It's a huge time waste and a huge cost waste for that. And Theo helps resolve that. For the user, a seamless in-wallet experience is one of the most important tenets of how Theo works. Most wallet naming solutions that exist out there, again, require you to, require you to use a specific app or require you to go to a, a specific website uh, and it has a portal, and so that's an attack factor that you have to deal with. Also, most of these solutions require you to actually manually map your public addresses, which means that you still have to be aware of what public addresses are to use most wallet naming solutions. With Theo, you don't have to do that. With Feel, you just register what's called a Feel address, which is our equivalent of basically a human readable wallet name. And it works automatically with every coin and every token in your wallet. You never have to manually map a thing. It automatically supports deterministic wallets. So if you want to constantly rotate out your public addresses, which you should, um, Feel automatically supports that. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to switch it up. You don't have to change it out. You don't have to worry about the security behind that. All that happens in a decentralized, secure manner that prevents manual attacks. And finally, privacy control. <coughs> privacy controls by default. Uh, this is one point that I think is actually very important that, unfortunately, I feel like a lot of people miss. One of the great nightmares of a wallet naming solution is that you are actually tying your public addresses potentially to an identity. Now, most people don't really think about the ramifications of that, but imagine a wallet naming solution that actually ties the public addresses of multiple blockchains together and to you. That's a huge problem. Field doesn't do that. Or at least Field is going to have options for that not to happen. We agree that privacy is a tenant of anti-censorship. Uh, in order to have something that actually makes blockchain work better, we can't ignore the most major and most important tenets of actually what makes blockchain important. And that, to us, privacy is one of those things. And so, for us, when you actually make a transaction using Field, from one Field address to another Field address, it doesn't necessarily reveal to that other people address everything about you. They can't identify all the different public addresses that you own. They can identify what tokens you have. They can just get that singular public address for that single transaction that you've given them permission to have access to. And that, to us, is one of the most important things about any sort of human-readable naming solution at all within this ecosystem, is that privacy is something that we already know in this room most people don't take seriously. Your grandmother doesn't care about She's given up everything right to Facebook. She doesn't know the difference. But she doesn't realize that with cryptocurrency, by using one of these naming solutions, she's giving up her bank account to everybody on the planet. That's a huge problem. And to us, we feel like we have to respect the reality of how cryptocurrencies are different and how they are self-sovereign and how there's responsibility associated with that. And because of that, privacy is actually wrong. It's a huge, huge thing. So, I'm actually going to go ahead and do something that is probably a little unconventional. My product uh, manager is here and he's going to be really stressed I'm about to do this, I'm guessing. Uh, I actually don't know if he's going to be here, so good luck with that. I'm actually going to show you Theo. So I am going to join the Zoom to myself. Let's 
share my screen. So this is my iPad. Actually, this is my wife's iPad. I've got colored. I took it this morning, so she's probably a little bit worried. Might be a lot of feedback here. Okay. Uh, so be our game for Nomi or both team members. Um, so I just want to show you real quick uh, how this works. So in BRD, and actually, if any of you actually have some of these wallets, so for Nomi or Edge or Trust Wallet, uh, they actually have kind of the initial set of new integrations ready on their wallet. So if any of you actually want to ask me uh, after this how to actually get to take a look at it, uh, you can actually do that now. But this is uh, something that we've been building, this is a demo on our own servers, but, so this is just the BRD wallet, BRD is an open source wallet, so they've been gracefully giving us permission to make a lot of edits to it. Under the menu, there's just a section called VO address. Uh, that's going to be problematic. <laughs> Alright, so, let's see if this works. Well, that's why we test things beforehand. So, ah, great. So, under BRD, under settings, there's a section called VO address. Right here is my VO address, John.BRD. Now imagine that I'm a completely different user using a completely different wallet, and I'm now using Coinomi. So, I'm going to show you actually right here, you guys can probably see it in case the screen doesn't update. This is just a Coinomi wallet, this is just on my iPad. Imagine this is a different person. This will catch up eventually. I have a VO address on this wallet. It is Dave.coinomi. I don't know Dave, I know David, but let's go ahead and actually go to Ethereum. Let's go to the receipt section. Let's go to the VO address tab. We'll wait for that to update. But I'll go ahead and plug in everything I'm trying to do. John.brd. Let's do. 001 Ethereum memo, let's say for tacos. Confirm the transaction. Now the fear always with doing these uh, live in conferences is that the interconnection, the internet connection is spotty and things sometimes will go right, but let's see what we can do. It's sent four tacos before, um, and you can see right here that it's going to send to Dave Dakinomi, which is the person I sent as. This is the amount of ether that they requested, and all I need to do is click the send button, and there it actually just brings up the transaction for the room. We actually do not intercept the transaction in any way. We work around before and after the actual launching transaction itself. And all I have to do is click the send button. This is a regular Ethereum transaction. Nothing else has changed. This entire process was done centrally, it was done securely. I never once even had to look at a public address if I didn't want to. And this is what our vision is for the future of blockchain. Uh, so what I want to do with, so I get you guys over to lunch, is, you know, blockchain usability uh, is a complicated issue. There's a lot of things actually that need to be fixed outside of public addresses. There's private key management, there's all sorts of things. But what we believe at VO is that fundamentally, decentralization shouldn't be difficult. Um, we believe that the masses will be coming to crypto eventually and that we owe them an experience that they actually deserve. Um, and so, as a parting gift, and get you guys out to lunch, uh, a few addresses right now are actually available uh, during our pre-sell phase. Let me go back to my slides real quick. I'll just skip to the end. A few address resales available right now, so if you have a wallet that is VO integrated, which is a lot of wallets, uh, you can reserve a few address on their domain right now if you want. Um, if you want to take a look at our white paper roadmap, please do, they're available on our website. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, you can join us on Telegram, there's a lot of interesting debates that happen on there, as you probably know. But the few address resale, uh, so right now, 
the pre-sale basically allows you to preserve a few actors or to bid on a custom domain if for some reason you want to protect your own brand. Right now it costs $2 for basically an entire year of use after maintenance. Uh, since I'm at this conference right now, I actually brought a gift uh, for everyone here in this room. I have a stack of postcards uh, in the back that I will put out for lunch that will actually have a unique QR code on it. If you scan it, I'll take you to the pre-sale site. If you make an account and just get in, you can actually reserve a few address for free. So for an entire first year after we launch Mainnet, you guys can play around with it, you can use it, you can enjoy it. If you don't like it, just don't renew it. If you love it, renew it. Uh, we will have you guys on board. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you very much for that presentation and definitely look up uh, Jonathan and the team for what they have as far as this new way to make crypto more friendly. And I think a lot